What is up and welcome to another edition of the Bruin Bible. Will Decker, your host. Make sure you guys are liking and subscribing the podcast. We are brought to you guys today by our advertisers. Our advertisers are Bell to Bell Fitness, Shator, a realtor out in Arizona, former Bruin alum, and my main man, Howard Chang, a realtor right here in Los Angeles. Let's go through them, guys. Uh, Bell to Bell Fitness is a boxing gym on the West Coast used by their FIT acronym, Fight Inspired Training. My main man, Tony Gonzalez, was the boxing coach for UCLA for over 10 years. He has built this gym on the West Side to learn how to boxing, stay in shape, and get you all the essentials you need to become somebody that is obsessed with boxing and fitness. Make sure to check it out. Go into Belt to Belt Fitness and say you heard about it from the Bruin Bible, and you're going to get a free session with Tony Gonzalez. So make sure to check that out. Shay Tor, my main man. Shay Tor is a real a licensed real estate agent in Arizona and a lifelong Bruin. He's a current Wooden Athletic Fund donor and football season ticket holder. When not selling houses or going to UCLA games, he loves to travel the country, checking out different arenas, ballparks, and stadiums. If you're looking to make the move to Arizona or know someone who is, please reach out to our loyal friend, Mr. Shea Tour. His phone number is 602-487-3975. Once again, his number is 602-487-3975. Make sure to check that out. And then the local realtor we got out here, Howard Chang. Howard Chang is a local realtor with the Serene team at EXP Realty. Their team has an office right here in Culver City. Though they help clients buy and sell homes all over the L.A. County and the surrounding areas, Howard and his team do a ton of business and are super in tune with the market, knowing winning strategies to give their clients a competitive advantage, have amazing vendor referrals, are a one-stop shop for anything real estate, and just provide a ton of value for their clients. Howard and his partner, Kyle Draper, are UCLA alums and a huge, huge fans of the UCLA football and basketball programs. You will often see them at games, tailgating and networking and staying involved with the UCLA alumni community. They would love to help any fellow alumni with accomplishing their real estate goals. So if you guys have any real estate needs in the LA area, look no further. Howard is your guy. All right, guys, we're going to go into the episode. What is up, guys? These words can't come out of my mouth fast enough. It is officially game week here for your UCLA Bruins. We have made it through the long slog of summer. Football season is officially here. It started this past weekend, and the UCLA Bruins are going to be traveling to Hawaii this next weekend to play the Rainbow Warriors. Madman, on a scale of 1 to 10, how excited are we to finally have the weight behind us and a game upon us, my friend? Brother, we're at an 11 here. I mean, on a scale of 1 to 10, I mean, it's hard to believe it's been nine months, Will. I mean, I would know. I'm expecting a baby here. You know, it's been nine (laughs) months since... Our last game, I mean, hard to believe that the L.A. Bowl was around mid-December, if we recall, kind of end of second week, beginning of third week of December. And now, once we have the kickoff upon us, it's the last day in August. So essentially eight and a half to nine months of the offseason, we've gone through coaching changes. We've gone through personnel changes. We've had press conferences heard around the world. We've had practice sessions heard around the world. I mean, UCLA football has been all over the globe, it feels like, these last eight and a half months, and it's great to get back on the field and talk about ball. Man, it really is. And Yeah, this was a long offseason for a lot of different <laughs> reasons, so it's nice just to be able to focus on football at this point, man, and there's just a lot to be excited about. Guys, we're going to be breaking down the exciting matchup between Hawaii and UCLA. It's going to be a little tougher than I think some people are going to expect with Hawaii uh, and us traveling to Hawaii as well. We're going to talk about what we want to see from the game, but the first thing I think we should start with, Mad Men, the depth chart was released today. Yes. And it's just exciting to kind of see this thing play out. TJ Harden being running back number one kind of stood out to me immediately. Well-deserved. I think he's a you know an incredible talent. But let's see how it kind of interacts in an Eric B. Enemy like offense. There's other two points that I really kind of, you know, illuminated to me, just, you know, reading the depth chart, seeing what was going on there. One, Logan Loya, as we kind of predicted, is the fourth receiver on this list. Rico Flores leading the way when it comes to that specific spot as the zebra, as they call it, you know, that yes. second op- option at wide receiver. And J. Mike being the X and the Y. Uh, is Maliki Matavao, the tight end, and Titus is getting the slot spot. So this is some big developments within UCLA. And then the other one that I got really excited about, Madman, 
Ollie Kayow is slated to start as the Will linebacker position. Man, we have been waiting for this since 2021. Ironically, the last game I think he played was Hawaii. It's Hawaii, yes. 2021. So this is like a three-year in the making type of thing for Ali Kao to come back. The last guy we had with this was Liatu Latu, who was the first pick in the NFL draft. Buddy, this is a big, big development with, you know, Ali Kao coming back and, you know, TJ Harden starting. What were some of the other takeaways you had from the depth chart list that just came out, brother? Yeah, Will. I mean, it's it's so well said. You, you broke it down so well. I think the first thing that kind of jumped out to me was the, the confirmation at the wide receiver position. You know, we talked about this sort of all spring, Will, and we kind of went in saying, hey, I think it's going to be J-Mac and Loya and Rico as kind of the first three guys. And then as we saw, particularly in fall camp, that connection that Garber's had with TMA, it just became apparent that TMA was going to find his way into that first string. And so kind of putting him in that Z slot, uh, J Mike at that X, and then now Rico Flores at the slot, you know, having those as the top three guys, we were sensing it was going to go that way. Hard to believe last year's leading receiver now is going to be the fourth receiver on this team. So that was absolutely significant. And then I think a little bit of a takeaway there with TJ, uh, I think, you know, for as difficult potentially as an offseason as he had in the spring, he and Eric Bieniemy really sort of having lots of on-the-field conversations and interactions. Uh, but I think the sense is that he's probably still your best every down back option. Now, it remains to be seen how long TJ Harden stays in that first string because, again, that Swiss Army knife that is Keegan Jones seems to be more conducive to an Eric Bieniemy offense. But I think out of respect, out of sort of stability, out of, you know, continuity, they're starting with Harden and seeing how the Keegan Jones dynamic plays out. And then, of course, tight end Mataval will and then the offensive line, the five that we knew was going to be the case, that's been sort of solidified here. Those were kind of the clear-cut five guys. And then defensively, Will, I think, you know, uh, your guy that, that you know, you've really liked for a while on that edge is, is Jacob Busic, you know, who's shown a lot of flashes uh, over the course of the, the, the spring and the fall. He's now got to step in and play a really big role. Big step up from where he played last year, but he's going to get that opportunity. Toia and Keanu anchoring the middle. I think we expected that. And then obviously, I was a little surprised that Oladijo and Medrano and Kehau were the, the three linebackers. I think Kehau, I think, was, was the surprise where given where he was, but I think the upside is significant. And then obviously, Will, there's that flirtation with Medrano is he going to be a linebacker or is he going to kind of be a pseudo edge? Is he going to be more like that Latu role? So I think they've been slotted into appropriate positions. Now, how how Eric Bieniemy and company sort of color outside the lines and how, you know, the defense as well as the offense colors outside the lines is going to be significant. Very significant. And it was shocking to me with K. Howe because I think he's an immense talent, was a former five-star guy. I mean, this is a guy Nick Saban brought to Alabama. Totally. For him transferred out but John John Vaughn's man has been here for two years and is very reliable like this is a very good football player that he kind of uh, displaced in the starting lineup right there and then when it comes from Logan Loya we saw some of it play out in spring and I want people to know Rico Flores is a real talent like this guy was offered by your Georgia's your Ohio State's he was the second leading receiver at Notre Dame last year as a true freshman a blue blood powerhouse program that is Notre Dame, love him or hate him. That's just the reality of the situation. So Rico Flores, we saw with his route running, we've said it all spring. He's kind of like this year's J. Mike, where we were very excited about J. Mike last spring. Rico has all the tools in the toolbox you want from a wide receiver. So Loya, I mean, as, as much as it pains me to see him outside the starting lineup, I'm kind of equally stoked for what Rico Flores could bring for the table and, you know, UCLA as a whole. You know, you know Will, what's interesting is as, as you were also talking that – as much as we have talked about the versatility, both on offense and defense, of kind of what we want to see, we, we're starting the season in a more traditional way, right? Like when you think about TJ Harden versus a Keegan Jones, when you think about an Ali Kehau versus a John John Vons, when you think about lining up Medrano at linebacker instead of edge, right? There was all of these kind of questions going into the season of thinking a little bit outside the box, maybe being a little bit more versatile, and I think to the coaching staff's credit, 
I think they're starting in a very sort of traditional fashion of sort of slotting these guys in their various positions. And then I think it becomes easier to get more versatile as you sort of progress in the season, as opposed to kind of maybe starting with, with sort of a non-traditional rotation and then trying to get more traditional later on. So I thought that was very interesting that, you know, John John's kind of that hybrid linebacker safety, but they're like, look, you know, that's a, that's a nice gadget. That's a weapon. Let's go with our traditional backer or, you know, uh, Keegan, obviously we've talked about, Hey, the ceiling here could be Marshall Falk 500, 500. They're like, well, that's a great Swiss army knife, but let's start with our traditional running back. And then, you know, so on and so forth. Medrano on the edge. Yes. Busich could use some reinforcements. We're a little light on the edge. We've moved a Chempong to the interior on that three-man rotation with Toia and Keanu. But let's start Madrano at linebacker traditionally where he's comfortable and then go from there. So I thought it was it, it's an ode to traditionalism to sort of start the season, which I think is right. Yeah, and it's it's tough. You mentioned a Champong, man. Not even listed as the backup for the nose and tackle spot. Yeah. Very raw talent. I mean, it makes sense why they moved him inside. 275, 280 is a behemoth of a human. And, I mean, he's like 19, 20 years old. So he's only going to get bigger at that size. So it'll be interesting to see what he does. They have, I think, a Kafusi and Tapaki kind of on the inside there. So that'll be yep. a really fun storyline to watch play out. All right, man, let's get down to Hawaii. And here's what I'm worried about with this game for UCLA fans. They had the luxury of playing a game last week, man. They won 35-14 to 14 over Delaware State. Having a game under your belt, you kind of iron out the kinks a little bit and you're ready to roll at full steam ahead, you know, in game number two. We didn't have the luxury of that. And we're going about five, six hours on a plane ride to Hawaii on the island. So, listen, I, I think on paper we are definitely the better team and there's a lot of advantages to that. But this team, I think, is very much improved. And I think this is a team that – Timmy Chang, former Hawaii quarterback, man. This guy was the all-time leader in passing yards and completion for the Rainbow Warriors and nationally until Case Keenum broke his record actually at Houston. Um, he has built the program back up. I mean, 9-18 and 18 as a head coach, but he started off with a bare chest. They won three games. They won five games this year. This is kind of the year three prove it, and it might be a bowl game for Hawaii when all is said and done, which is a huge victory for Hawaii. Uh, they got some talent on the offensive side of the ball. And I think the big storyline is Titus is going to be playing his brother, Tomatau, uh, Mokiawa, and Timalala. The duel, he had two catches for 30 yards in their game against Hawaii. Titus obviously named the starter as a slot. How cool is it that two brothers are going to be battling it out on Saturday, Madman? No, it's amazing. And Tomatau is so happy for him. Obviously, you mentioned, Will, the two, the, the two catches for 30 yards, but also one of those catches was for a touchdown. And so, you know, big performance there to start. And, so obviously, you know, what a what a huge moment there, uh, you know, for the family to be able to see both sons. I know, uh, you know, the family watches the show and, and we're such big fans of them. And, and what a wonderful family that they have created and the values and, and just, you know, they do all the, the right things. And so we're very appreciative uh, to them. And, and just this is a huge moment for uh, to see two brothers go at it, play the same position. So, you know, there's really an opportunity for a lot of fireworks on both ends. Well, I think you said it best. The the opportunity to kind of get the kinks out that first game is really significant. Hawaii uh, at home, Delaware State, obviously uh, not, a, not an FBS team, but you're just kind of getting the reps in. And I think Hawaii walks away from that game saying, hey, we there's a lot we can improve on. I think the thing that I took away, Will, was even though Timmy Chang is the coach and he's been known for passing it all over the field with with those kind of June Jones like offenses, you know, that's that that similar tree in the pedigree that they come from. I think Hawaii played with a lot of balance. When when you look at it, they had 34 throws, they had 28 runs, uh, you know, so they're trying to create a sense of balance uh over the, on the offensive side of the ball. I think they struggled a little bit 203 yards passing, 128 yards rushing. 331 total yards is a bit of a modest number, Will, when you're talking about kind of a non-FBS uh, team at home. But I think just kind of getting those kinks out, uh, I think, is very significant. Now they have the comfort, the luxury of playing at home game two. And you know they're going to be rallying it. I mean, in a lot of ways, you wonder, did Hawaii leave a little bit off of the playbook to kind of get this first win under their belt to really put it out there? Will, you mentioned it. Year three for Timmy Chang. Oh, my God, what, what what a statement that would be if he could find a way to upset UCLA at the beginning of year three 
to take this program to a completely different trajectory. So they're going to approach this as their Super Bowl, as their college football playoff. Being at home, I think it's going to be a really raucous crowd. Hawaii, uh, that home field is very significant between the crowd, between the time difference. You know, these are non-traditional kickoff times for UCLA. So the Bruins have to be ready to play. I think there's a significant amount of talent at UCLA in terms of advantage. If you look at the Bruin roster versus the Rainbow Warrior roster, but you got to be focused, you got to be ready to go. And I think the start is going to be pivotal. I think that first quarter, let's see that Eric Bieniemy offense at work. Let's get up a couple of scores and take the air and the momentum out of the stadium. If this thing goes and is a competitive game for a quarter, a quarter and a half, belief starts setting in, you know, then it can be sort of a dogfight in the second half and then anything can happen. Yeah, and, you know, the quarterback, Braden Shager, the numbers didn't do it justice because all the recaps I read and watched, the wind was a huge factor yes. in that game. So he was 17-34 at 34 through the year. So take that with a grain of salt. This guy threw for, you know, 3,000-plus passing yards last year and 26 touchdowns. He's a very good quarterback. He was able to get done two through the air, two on the ground. He was a dynamic running the ball. And here's the big key. I think you mentioned it. They were able to balance it out a lot more. But the stat that kind of blew me away when it came to Hawaii last year, they were 5-0 and when they ran for more than 67 yards as a team last year. They were they lost eight games. All eight games they lost is when they didn't run for more than 67 yards. So if they can run the ball effectively, it seems like they've got a shot in any one of these games. But if the defense shows up for UCLA, obviously that stacked linebacking room can come out there and make some plays. We might be able to prevent – you know, upset watch when it comes to playing Hawaii on the road. You got to respect every opponent you play. You know, I think UCLA is on paper much more talented in a lot of different areas, but this team's legit. They returned two of their top three tacklers. Peter Manuma, the safety, is a badass, man. 87 tackles, three interceptions last year, coming back. And then Logan Taylor, the guy who led the team in tackles in 2022, he was out all of last year, so he's coming back. He's going to play. They have guys that it, it feels very much like a senior leadership team and the, and the team that potentially has the leadership to change the tides of the program and try to build it into a consistent winner out there in Hawaii. So there's just a lot of different storylines coming in there. I'm predicting UCLA to win. I think it's going to be, you know, I'd say 42-17 in a good-like environment. That would be my prediction. Um, do you have any predictions on the surface when it comes to the score of this ball game? Man? Absolutely, Will. And I think you you brought up a couple of great points. You know, with Shager, what's interesting is that the fact that Timmy Chang had the confidence to throw the ball 34 times in the wind, right? Like, he didn't change their sort of game plan in terms of passing aggressiveness. And that's a signal because if you have questions about your quarterback or you have questions about your offense, you are going to significantly change the number of attempts or the usage rate of that quarterback, depending on the weather, if it's adverse to a passing game. They didn't do that at all. Shager dropped back 34 times. He, he let it fly in the wind. So there's a tremendous amount of confidence that exists there. Number two, Will, I think your point about the 67 yards is, is key because this in many ways sort of reminds me of a San Diego State game last year or a game against Colorado last year where if this is sort of last year's team with Latu and the Murphy Twins and Carl Jones Jr., we're going to get after Shager and he's going to get very uncomfortable. Here, there's still some questions on the edge. Now, we know Toia and Keanu are going to sort of totally collapse that interior. The question is going to be, is Hawaii going to be able to get some cheap yards on the edge? Are they going to be able to run some sort of zone, uh, you know, some zone concepts on the edge from a running game perspective, run away from the interior, which is the strength of that UCLA defense this year, and allow kind of these edge guys and these linebackers in, in more of these one-on-one -on -one situations? That's going to be the key. So as long as UCLA can set the edge, Will, I think there's going to be a lot of dominance to come in the game if UCLA is not able to set the edge. And no matter how good Toya is and Keanu is, it's hard to generate a pass rush from the interior, right, Will? So if Shager can kind of sit back, even if guys aren't open initially, secondary openings tend to happen, plays become five, six, seven seconds, he can get the ball out, start moving the ball, then it becomes a little bit of uh, an interesting ball game in that regard where then 
They can run it a little bit, but then because they know they can drop back and have more slow developing plays turn into positive yards, they're in the game. So to me, the key matchup here, Will, is going to be who, how quickly can UCLA set the edge to eliminate the, the, the sort of the zone running game of Hawaii and also get after Shager and make him really uncomfortable. I think they will be able to do that, to your point, fairly quickly. And I agree with you. I see a very similar outcome. I see a 38-17 UCLA. Yeah, 38-17. I think that's very fair, man. We're kind of in the same ballpark when it comes to the score. UCLA, if they do everything we expect them to do, should win by multiple scores in this game. Let's talk to some key players and what we'd like to see. Each of us get two on this one. It'll just be a fun way to kind of cap the preview episode for Hawaii. And I'm going to piggyback off your point. Um, We need to bring more pressure. And the guy that I'm looking for, he's played well in huge games in the past. We kind of saw him switch. He's a freak athlete. He started as a receiver at UCLA. Now as a linebacker. Kane Madrano, your time is now, brother. We need that edge presence, especially with the Latus, the Murphy twins gone. Jacob Busic and Alpew, you know, as the edge rushers. I don't feel completely confident this could succeed in a Big Ten-like environment. So the odds of us having to send more guys to generate more pressure is going to be a necessary factor. If Kane Madrano is a disruptor in this first game, this could set the tone and build his confidence as a pass rusher for the entire season moving forward. I got to give it to Kane. Kane is my first pick in this because I think he plays such a vital role to the ceiling of this team in hitting their maybe seven to eight win mark that we think they can get, Matt, man. So what is your thoughts on that first pick? And give me your first pick as we keep it moving. No, Thriller. I mean, that's uh, it would be my first pick if it wasn't your first pick. I mean, it's a, it's a phenomenal point. I think in many ways, Madrano is going to be the linchpin of this game as a springboard uh, to, to a vital start that we need, given that middle of the season, that ability to set the edge. I will sort of be related to that, and I think it's it's Femi Oladijo, right? And I think if if Medrano is the primary emphasis in terms of what we're looking for to set the edge, I want to see Oladijo have one of those kind of sideline to sideline games. I think this is going to be one where you know there's some shifty backs, uh, you know, out of the backfield with Hawaii. They got some twitchy slot guys. I think Femi is going to be sort of sideline to sideline. I think he may come in. Uh, help stop the run. I think he's going to play a little bit of spy on Shager from time to time to sort of limit his ability to move around and be super comfortable. So I see Oladijo as having a massive impact in this game. I'm looking for him in that kind of 8 to 12 tackle range here, Will, and really put his imprint uh, sideline to sideline in this game and and really solidify kind of being the captain uh, of this front seven the way and take that torch officially from Darius Moasel. Uh Hawaii transfer as well, Darius Exactly. Moasel as well. So great point on that, my friend. There's so many different ways I can go with my last pick. I mean, am I excited to see Toya really kind of put it together all for his senior year? That's a point I would definitely make. Uh, you know, Rico Flores skyrocketing up the board, taking the leading receiver's job. Very interesting. But, man, we got to go back to last year. J. Michael Sturdivant. The time is now, my friend. We are pumped to see you. When you had consistent quarterback play, you were amazing. You finished it off with the bowl game. You know how I am with the momentum you can build from a bowl game-like environment into the next season. Four catches, 142 yards, and a touchdown. Let's see it, man. We thought, you know, our ceiling for this guy a week ago was he could be a first-team All-Big Ten receiver. You plant those seeds in the early games of the season. So let me see that you can be that first-team All-Big Ten wideout. Give me a bomb. Give me a touchdown. Let's go 80, 90 yards in a score. Maybe gets pulled in the third quarter or something like that. But just even having that type of stat line, you go, oh, man, we got the guy we think we got, and it's going to be trouble for defenses all season long. So J. Mike is my pick on that. What do you think about that, brother? And where are you going with your last pick? Oh, I love it. I mean, J. Mike, and and let's not forget, Will, what gangbusters he started last year with against Coastal Carolina. We want to see some similar fireworks this year to really establish him as that ultimate deep threat for Ethan Garbers. If Garbers has that, you know, chemistry and connection with TMA that he does and Flores kind of becomes that intermediate guy, then Sturdivant has to become the the deep threat that we all know he's so capable of and he's shown. So hopefully uh, offensive line holds up and enables him to be able to do this. And that's what kind of gets me to the last point here, Will. I was sort of debating between, hey, 
do I want something from TJ Harden here in terms of does yeah. he kind of establish himself as RB1 in a game like this? And how quickly does Eric Bieniemy go to Keegan Jones in a game like this? I'm going to be really looking out for that. But I think the, so that's going to be significant. But I think, Will, from a collective perspective, I'm looking at the offensive line. This, this should yeah. be a game where Ethan Garber should be relatively upright most of the game. His uniform should be relatively pristine. He should have the time that he needs to be able to get it to Sturdy, to be able to go to TMA, to be able to go to Flores. Their running lane should be open. I think that's what I'm really looking for, that there are seamless moments here from an offensive perspective. No sacks allowed, you know, very few penalties. I think I'm looking at the technique and the discipline of this offensive line because that's going to be the key to this whole season moving forward, particularly in Big Ten play. So my eyes are on that Fab Five, Will, as sort of my second kind of group pick. Love it, man. Yeah, that is, yeah, the offensive line, it will be a test to see how well they can gel this quickly as, you know, Unige and Makaheli, we know what the talent is. We know these guys are good players, but lines, they take a little while to gel. So I want to see how that looks. That's a great point to kind of close it out on. I think two other points, the running back competition is going to be on our eyes all season long, at least in the first parts of the games. How's Harden looking? How Keegan's looking? This is going to be fun because Bianami's offense is completely different from Chips. Totally. And you saw it, you saw it with uh, the quote from Loya, you know, talking about Bianami's offense. He goes, we have so many different new play calls than what we totally. had. It's been a huge kind of learning curve when it comes to that for UCLA. So that's one thing I'm watching. And, I mean, what is a Bruin Bible episode if I'm not going to mention the secondary, man? Come <laughs> on. This is Hawaii. They throw the ball a lot. You mentioned the June Jones tree. They're going to have their reps. I want to see how they respond because Kirkwood and Davies, we can't use the excuse that they're young and undisciplined players anymore. They are veterans of the craft. K.J. Wallace is at the nickel. I feel very confident in him. And then we got two new safeties in Braylon Addison and our guy Ramon Henderson. So this is going to be fun to watch how the secondary does it. If it's a little less windy out there in Hawaii, I think they're throwing the ball 40, 45 times in this game, especially if they're down early like we expect them to be. So secondary needs to show up and make some plays. Madman, we have made it. The long wait is over. College football season is here. Bruin fans, thank you for listening once again. Please like and subscribe. We have some great stuff coming your guys' way this year. Don't go anywhere. We're going to try to get Wayne Cook on this week and maybe some other people as well to talk everything Bruins. You guys have a great rest of your evening. And thank God football season is back, baby.